Hello, and thank you for joining me today for Real Estate, Religion, and You. My name is Dr. Sylvia Black, licensed real estate broker with Affordable Homes and Apartments. I'm licensed to preach and ordained as a minister, and I have my Ph.D. in Sacred Biblical Studies. And I'd like to thank you for joining me today. Today I'd like to talk to you on a continued basis of my book, Seven Last Words, which is available on barnesandnobles.com, Books of the Law, and more, as well as CreateSpace, Lulu.com, and at a bookstore near you. And this book talks about the seven last words that Jesus spoke as he hung on the cross, being crucified to die for your sins and for mine. And I'd like to thank you for joining me today for Real Estate, Religion, and You. And today we're going to be talking about the fifth word, which is I thirst. Okay, and then we're going to be getting our scripture from uh, the book of John, chapter 1 through 44. John 4, 4th verse, chapter 1 through 44, New Living Translation. And it reads thusly, Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than, than John through Jesus himself didn't baptize them. His disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had gone through Samaria on the way. Eventually he came to Samaria village of Sychar near the field of Jacob gave him, near the field that Jacob gave him, to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from a long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone on to the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. How many of you are facing discrimination and racism issues today? Jesus said, uh, so uh, she said to Jesus, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, If you only knew the gifts that God has for you and who you were speaking to, you wouldn't ask me and I would give you living water. You would ask me, and I would give you living water. But, sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said. She still don't understand. And this well is very deep. Where would you get living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestors, Jacob, who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and the animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon thirst again. Okay, become thirsty again. But those who drink the water that I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I will never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. She still don't understand. Go and get your husband, she told her. He, Jesus told her, I don't have a husband, the woman replied. You're right, Jesus said. Uh, you don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now, and you certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet, so tell me, why is it that the Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship, while we Samaritans claim it here at Mount Gerizim, where our ancestors worship? Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about one you worship, while we Jews know all about. For we know all about him, for salvation comes through Jews. But the time is coming; indeed, it is here now, when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship Him in that way, for God is spirit. So those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. The woman said, "I know the Messiah is coming, the one who called the Christ." When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Jesus then, just then, uh, Jesus' disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman. But none of them had the nerve to ask, What do you, do? What do you want with her? Or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the one and ran back to the village, telling everyone, Come and see the man who told me everything I did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming for the village to see. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus replied, 
I have a kind of food that you know nothing about. He said, the disciples said, did someone bring you food here while we were gone? The disciples said to each other, they still didn't understand. Then Jesus explained, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest, but I say wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe from harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages and the fruit of the harvest, wait a minute, the, the fields are ready for and ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike? You know the saying, one plants and another harvests, and it's true. I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant. Others had already done the work, and now you will get to gather the harvest. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. All right, um, we're talking about the word that Jesus spoke on the cross, which is, I thirst. He had become thirsty. Many Samaritans believed in Jesus because the woman said he told me everything I did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed for two more days, long enough for, for more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. Jesus was thirsty as we all are thirsty. But if we only knew who we were talking to, and we would believe, then we wouldn't doubt in our hearts when it comes to having faith in our master. <laughs> Jesus' tongue stuck to the roof of his mouth as he hung on the cross. He was laid in the dust and left for dead. And they gave him gall and vinegar to drink, and he spit it out. That was sort of like liquor today. Uh, they were offering him bitterness in spirit. And then his goal would not have been accomplished on the cross. Psalm 69, 21, New Living Translation says, But instead they gave me poison for food. They offered me sour wine for my thirst. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be made white as snow. My grace is sufficient for thee. When we are weak, he is strong. For greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Psalm 42, 4, King James Version says, As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee. How many of you are panting for Jesus right now? How many of you are thirsty for the water, that this living water that Jesus can give us, each and every one of us? Okay, I know I am. Okay, as he panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee. O God, my soul thirsteth for thee. For the living God, when shall I come and appear before God? <clears throat> Okay, Romans 8.38 says, Am I convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love? Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow. For even the powers of hell can, for not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So the passage of living water is referring to hungering and thirsting after righteousness, okay, which can be defined as behavior that is morally justifiable and right. Such behavior is characterized by accepted standards of morality, justice and virtue, or uprightness. The Bible's standard of human righteousness is, gone, um, is God's own perfection of every attribute, Every attitude, every behavior, and every word, thus God's law is given in the Bible, both describe his own character and constitute the plumb line by which he measures human righteousness. The Greek New Testament word for righteousness primarily describes conduct in relation to others, especially with regards to rights of others in business, in legal matters, and, and in the, and the beginning with relationships to God. It is contrasted with wickedness, the conduct uh, of the one who, out of the gross self-centeredness, neither reserves God nor respects him. The Bible describes a righteous, righteous person as just or right, holding to God and trusting to him, Psalms 38, 18-22. The bad news is that true and perfect righteousness is not possible for man to attain on his own. 
The standard is simply just too high. The good news is that the true righteousness is possible for mankind, but only through the cleansing of sin by Jesus Christ and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We have no ability to achieve righteousness in and of ourselves. We need God's help in order to do that. If you don't know how to do it, just ask Him. But Christians possess the righteousness of Christ because God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God, 2 Corinthians 5.21. This is an amazing truth on the cross. Jesus exchanged our sin for his perfect righteousness so that we can one day stand before God and he will see not our sin, but the holy righteousness of the Lord Jesus. This means that we are made righteous in the sight of God. That is, that we are accepted and righteous and treated as righteousness by God on account of what the Lord Jesus has done. He has made sin and we are made righteousness. On the cross, Jesus was treated as if he was a sinner. Okay? He was treated as if he was a sinner, though he was perfectly holy and pure the entire time. Okay? We are treated as if we are righteous, though we are defied and, pray and depraved on account of what the Lord Jesus has endured on our behalf. We are treated as if we, are, as if we had entirely fulfilled the law of God on our own and had never become exposed to its penalty. We have received the precious gift of righteousness from God of all mercy and grace. To Him be the glory. Okay, glory be to the Lord, Father, God, in heaven above. Okay, now it is important. Are you thirsty right now? Do you crave with urgency uh, the thirst of God to, to worship Him in spirit and in truth? Okay, it is important for us to be honest with ourselves with regard to our desire for God to be a part of our life. Okay, if we're truly thirsty, uh, thirsting after God and everything He has to offer, including His righteousness, we can expect His gifts and His blessings to flow through us in our lives and in our families' lives like a river. I say flow through us because the blessings will pour down on our children. Okay, they will pour down on us and they will pour to continue to pour down on our children and for generations to come. Okay, uh, our righteousness will stream down on the people we, we come in contact with from day to day at work and at play. Unsaved and saved alike will they see how we get down, um, so to speak, you know, how we get down and how we got over. Okay, and hopefully they will want a taste of God's living water. Okay, there's a time and a place for everything, you know. Craving can also be defined as a very strong desire for something. When we crave for God, we have a strong desire for God, to serve Him, to be at His mercy and His will, to let Him use us as He will, and to do His will, and for us to work out, for our, His will to work in us. Okay, we have an intense, urgent desire and a longing for Jesus. You know, the saying, though He slay me, yet I will serve Him. You know, you could be in the middle of persecution and whatnot. You know, you know anything could have happened. You could have lost your job. You could have, you know, you could be facing foreclosure. You could be, you know, uh, dealing with a, a, a relational relation issue. You know, a divorce, a separation. Okay, whatever. Your child. You know, something happened with your children, your family, your school. Anything could have happened. You get a phone call, a letter in the mail, an email, a text message, or a knock at the door it could change your life forever. You know, can you still crave God in the midst of the persecution and all hell breaking loose? That's what we're talking about when we're talking about cravings. To still to long for God's righteousness. You know, a lot of people used to think that when you get saved that it's boring. You know, a saved life is a boring life. If you look at some of the way Christians used to live their life, you know, I don't think that God ordained uh, us to live our lives, you know, as a boring person, you know, because he gives us life and life eternal. So when you have life, you have joy and, and you know, enter into the, the, the uh, to his house with praise and thanksgiving. You know, he inhabits our praise, you know, and all of these things. You can't be all miserable and screw face if you're going to praise God. You got to be happy, you know, and, and, and joyful, you know. And, and and you can't be all mean and looking and like you said, you know see a lot of elderly folks they be looking around and sitting around just sitting in their rocking chair and whatnot you know and just rocking and whatnot you know maybe talking about what used to happen yesterday you know what about today what about tomorrow you know you already given up on your life and you're only half, you're not even halfway there yet you know you you looking at the number of years you've been on the face of the earth rather than the day what's in the day today you know. You, and, and people just seem to live their life in a boring kind of way, you know, when you become a Christian and they start, and that's the same thing with me when I, when I first got saved, you know, I wanted to be saved, you know, but I didn't know what to do with myself when I got saved, you know, because I'm like, now what do I do, because I used to go partying almost every night, you know, 
And, um, you know, now I don't go party. And, you know, does that mean that I have to stop dancing? You know, so I asked the Lord to teach me how to do the holy dance in the church. And the first time I did the holy dance in church, I did the shake, 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 you know. <laughs> you know, and I was like, you know, and then I remember the pastor looked right at me. He said, this here is a church. You know, in other words, don't come in here doing no, you know, no, no shake, 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 you know, your, bo your body parts, you know what I'm saying? But it was all good, you know, because, you know, God inhabited that and he was teaching me, you know. And I had already asked him before I went to church, so I knew that that was an ordained move by God, you know, because I'm a joyful person and there's no way that I could just sit around and just with my arms crossed and my legs crossed and just say, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if God be willing, man, you know. I mean, I got to get out and go and do something, you know, I don't care what it looks like, I have to, you know, always be striving for something better, and when I get to excellence, I'm going to strive for brilliance, and when I get for brilliance, then I'm going to keep on striving for better, and just keep getting better and better, you know, at myself, and help others to reach that plateau as well, you know, but some people are just satisfied, they're just content with where they are, you know, because they're letting society rule and dictate their lives, and that means that I don't believe that they're really serving God in spirit and in truth, if you allow that to happen. You know, if you crave God, then you're craving everything about Him. You know, Jesus didn't sit still for a moment. He walked all across when He was on the face of the earth. He was walking here and walking there, preaching the gospel. He kept busy. He was doing a whole lot of stuff. You know, and now He taught this person, He taught that person, and everything, and everything was for the glory of the Lord. And as a result of Him being crucified on the cross and dying on the cross for our sins, now He sits at the right hand of Jesus. And then as a servant of Christ, now we sit at the right hand of Christ. Okay, but we can't go to the Father unless we go to Christ now. That was the privilege of Jesus after having hung on the cross and died on the cross. Now, now we have to go through Christ in order to get what we need. That's why you have to say, in the name of Jesus, amen, after you say your prayer. You know, I'm blessed in the name of Jesus. Thank you, God, for a wonderful day in the name of Jesus. You know, you have to learn all of the intricate details about, you know, serving God, you know. And there's nothing boring about that, you know, especially you're dealing with a man... Uh, a man who is a genius, he's a smart, he's an intellect, he's the best at everything that he does and he will never die. And we can't, you know, think that, you know, a man like that is 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 limited. You know, we put the limits on him. He's not he's not limited. We're the ones who end up putting the limits on. Take the limits off of God right now. And say if you don't know how to say it out your mouth. You know, it's amazing that what what we say what we think in our head controls our body and what we say out of our mouth controls our life. Isn't that amazing? If you realize that, then you'll know. You, what you do is a lot of thoughts come into your head. You know, you say, oh, uh, you know, I'm thirsty. Am I thirsty? I don't know. You might say, I'm thirsty. I want some, I want some oranges. No, I want some, you know, you put that thought in your head. You know, you got to think pleasant thoughts, you know, in order to be able to serve God in spirit and in truth, in order to know how to crave him. And then he will, you know, teach us. He will show you, you know, a small, still voice. He whisper right deep down in your spirit, and he'll let you know what time it is. Okay, now in Isaiah 55, New International Versions, it says, Come all ye who are thirsty, come to the waters, ye who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the riches of fair. Now that sounds encouraging. Give ear and come to me and listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love, promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a ruler and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon uh, nations you know not, the nations you do not know will come running to you, because you, of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. Seek the Lord while he may be found, call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God, for he will freely pardon, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and make it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so it is my word that goes out from my mouth. I will not return to, it will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for what I sent it, for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. 
instead of the thorn bush will instead the thorn bush will grow the juniper and instead of the briars and the myrtle will grow this will be the lord's renown for an everlasting sign that will endure forever may the lord add a blessing to the reading of his and hearing doing uh, and of his mighty powerful and magnanimous word you know if you only believe you wouldn't doubt in your heart and then you would know that Jesus is the Messiah and he can grant us our heart's desire yeah, that rhymes in Luke 19 28 uh, King James Version it says after this knowing that all things were now accomplished that the scripture might be fulfilled saith I thirst Luke 19 29 King James Version says now there was a set of vessel full of vinegar and they filled the sponge with vinegar and put it unto hyssop and put it in his mouth yes Jesus was thirsty for water to satisfy his flesh but he was also promising us he also promises us living water water that quenches more than the physical thirst but living water that satisfies the spirit as well have how many of y'all are thirsting after this living water I have thirsted for many years in my life and have thirsted after Jesus but never have thirsted in my whole heart until I was made to suffer as a slave to righteousness okay um, Jesus I think that's why a lot of times Jesus does these things so that to make us uh, draw us closer to him either you're either drawing closer to God or you draw closer to another God one or the other you know but the main purpose is if you really truly crave him you will continue to seek after him and you will draw nearer to him as these trials and tribulations come upon you Jesus made time many times explained to us in the Bible that our instruct about what our instructions are Okay, but it wasn't until I finally came to him fully and completely that I was able to understand what the true meaning of thirsting after Jesus meant when it says, I thirst. Psalm 42, 1, 2 says, As a deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants after thee. My God, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. John 4, 13, 14 says, Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever shall drink of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. And what does water do? Basically, it refreshes, it cleanses. Okay, and if you see somebody that, you know, cleansed and refreshed, then you know that they probably possess with living, that they have that living water. Revelation 7, 16, 17 says, they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun beat down on them. Okay, uh, neither shall the sun beat down on them. Not any heat for the lamb in the center of the, thro of the throne shall be their shepherd and shall guide them to the springs of the water of life and shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. So often we go through stuff and mess and junk and in this world that causes us to become thirsty. God promises living water not just to satisfy the flesh, but to satisfy the soul and the spirit. He makes it clear that we must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So this means that the things that life gets when you know when things of life gets us down, God's living will not become parched and dried out. But if you partake of this living water on a daily basis, for example, reading the Bible, praising Him, worshiping Him, going to church, you know, you are allowing God, uh, allowing God's word to become alive in us. Then our soul will become uh, desiccated. If uh, if you don't allow these things, you know, then your soul will not become desecrated or shriveled up. The same way that water satisfies the flesh, the same way that living water satisfies the spirit. And as I said in the previous chapter, God is interested more in developing God-like character in us that is consistent with His Word. Once we have tasted God's living water and His righteousness, it begins to become a part of us. God's living water has righteousness is now evident in us. The things that we used to do, we don't do anymore. I don't do anymore. I hope you don't do them anymore either. Uh, the places we go, we don't do them anymore. We don't go there anymore. We don't hang out with those people that we used to hang out with, even if they're blood-related relatives. You don't hang out with them if you're uh, unequally yoked. Okay, we now have no desire for the fountain water because God's living water offers us so much more. We need regular water in order to sustain us, so we also need uh, God's water to sustain our spirit. One without the other is not going to work. You can drink all the water you want to from the faucet, but if you don't have the living water, then your spirit's going to get shriveled up. Okay? Um, we have no, we have, 
we have now some people have the desire for fountain water and some people have the desire for uh, living water we crave the things of the spirit instead of craving and lusting after the things of the physical okay you're in the physical but not of the physical okay you don't have to uh, war after the flesh you know um, but you know that you know you have to take care of the flesh okay um, let's just go back here we begin to develop a relationship with God, and out of that relationship we build with God, He can now move in our lives in ways that we haven't even dreamed of if we only believe and knew who you were talking to. God is a God of the impossible. The possible. He can make things happen. You may not see a way, but God can make a way out of no way. You got to trust and believe that. We don't have, sometimes you may not even have a clue as to who you serve, you know, the mighty and powerful God that we serve. Um, but, you know, of what God has in store for us. But there's so much more that God has in store for us. Rather than being saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost, there's so much more life that we can live without having to sin. For example, eternal life, God's protection against death, blessings. Even the, though the world is coming against us, He can fulfill all of our needs even when man tries to deny us. We don't have to be without, um, but we are promised that He will never leave us nor forsake us. It says, I just read it to you in the scripture. So much more that man could never, uh, never do uh, is why, is because man is human, just like you and I. Okay, they're made out of the same flesh and blood that you and I are made out of. Okay, uh, they fall short of their promises because they can't fulfill everything. They're human, just like you and I are. You know, um, but God can deliver everything. God will never fail. Now, what does living water mean? Uh, Jesus is the source of living water and extends this invitation to all those who thirst and accept what Christ Jesus has to offer us. What does Jesus have to offer? Jesus uses water as symbolic sense. John 4:14. 4, Jesus answered and said, Everyone who drinks of this water shall thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I give you him shall become in him a well of water springing up in eternal life. Uh, John 4, thir chapter 4, verse 13 to 14. Jesus has offered a woman at the well some water. Living water, verse 10. She seems to doubt him, verse 11 and 12. But Jesus responds again and promises that she will never thirst again. Uh, this is some kind of special water, I must say, a living water. Why don't, you, why don't you give it a try? The water gives us eternal life. So what kind of water is Jesus really talking about? Okay. He gives us the answer later in John 7, 38, 39. Okay. He whom believes in me, as the scripture says, but this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. John 7, 38 to 39. Okay, Jesus used water as a symbol for the Holy Spirit. He gives us the Holy Spirit to dwell in us, seal us, and fill us up. Okay, notice that Jesus is talking about rivers of living water. Rivers of living water that are flowing out of the believers continuously. We need to ask ourselves what kind of living waters are flowing through us now. Okay, what kind of waters are flowing through us now. Jesus uses the phrase living water in two instances in the Bible. For the first instance he found in John, uh, Jesus was tired and sat down at the well while his disciples went on to town to buy food. A Samaritan woman came to draw water and Jesus asked her for a drink. The Samaritan woman was shocked because Jesus was a Jew and the Jews are supposed to hate the Samaritans. Okay, of course, she had no idea who Jesus was, that he was actually the Messiah, you know. But she knew he was a Jew and asked him, why are you asking me for water? In other words, go you know, get it yourself. She recognized that he didn't have a, a bucket or a rope, okay, and she was sympathetic to that issue when she said that to him. But Jesus ignored the question and went right to the point. If you knew the gift that God has for you and who you were talking to, um, he would have given you that's this living water that I'm speaking of, John 4.10. Jesus is now in the, temple, in the temple surrounded by worshipers. He suddenly cries out, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures say, from this innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this uh, he spoke to the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. John 37, 39. And, okay? Here Jesus uh, refers to the Holy Spirit as a living water. Eternal influence of the Spirit had always been given in the conversation of sanctification and the Old Testament saints' prophet. Okay? But the gifts of the Spirit, who would indwell believers... Had not yet been received. Acts 10, 40, 44, 45. 
So though many people say that Jesus is living water, Jesus himself intended the phrase to mean the Holy Spirit who dwells in believers and seals them for salvation, Ephesians 1, 13, 14. It is the ministry of the Spirit flowing out of the heart, redeemed by God, that blesses believers and through him brings life and light to the world. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing doing of his mighty, powerful, and magnanimous word. I've been talking to you about my book, Seven Last Words, which is available on BarnesandNobles.com. And we're going to conclude this session now with that. And if you listen to uh, one of my other YouTube, I have the song Living Water on there. And you can, you know, those who, you know, fill my cup, Lord, fill it up and make me whole. How many of y'all want to be made whole today? Okay. Please join me again next week right here on uh, Time Warner Public Access TV Channel 20. And for Real Estate Religion and You, my name is Dr. Sylvia Black, and I'm the host. And I've been talking about my book, Seven Last Words, which is available on bondsandnobles.com, as well as books galore and more. And I'm going to holler at a sister. Peace out.